Father, we commit, Father, we teach our own to your Father, we pray for that Father, we celebrate you tonight, Lord. We declare this place upon God as a baptism place for the enemy. Father, we pray that you will be the one to do the work of the enemy. Father, we pray that you will be the one to do the work of the enemy. Father, we pray that you will be the one to do the work of the enemy. In the name of Jesus, Father, tonight we break their chains of command. Wherever they are gathered, tonight we destroy their chains of command. Excellent Father, we pray for you, God. Father, we pray for your anointing, God. We pray for your grace. Father, you move tonight. You move tonight, God. You move tonight. Father, we pray for you. Make your sleep tonight. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Good evening, church. Good evening. Welcome back again to another a very interesting study of the book of Hebrew um, from the last chapter chapter 7 that has been properly dealt with by our general Vasya Dr. Usman and uh, Pastor Pa they have already tried as much as possible to uh, let us know the supremacy of Jesus Christ over the all the prophets, all the all the priests that um, existed from time immemorial, especially after the patriarch and um, the the author of the Hebrew, try as much as possible from chapter seven to let us know the supremacy of Jesus Christ as a king and also as a priest. Uh, 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 of the order of Melchizedek over the priesthood of the Levitical order which was uh, the one that uh, God uh, ordered the Moses to um, sanctify Aaron and his uh, sons you know to be the, the, the priest for him and as um, Pastor Mana has already explained to us that is why God set apart the the tribes of Levi, you know, among the twelve tribes of Israel, to to minister unto God, and the author continue in in chapter eight, which we shall be dealing with tonight, which is also very very interesting, and um, I will be so happy, you know, for you to fire questions so that we can know exactly what he's trying to to tell us, because it's, it's going further in chapter eight to lay emphasis on the supremacy of Jesus Christ, not only as a king and priest or the other Melchizedek, uh, or, but is also now going straight away in, into the divinity of Jesus Christ, the supremacy of Jesus Christ as a permanent high priest and, 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 as, a, uh, and as a permanent king. So um, let us read there, uh, let us open our Bible to Hebrew chapter 8 we're going to read the whole thing now the main point of what we are saying is this we do not have a high priest who sat down at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heaven and who serves in the sanctuary the true tabernacle set up by the Lord not by a mere human being Every high priest is appointed to offer both gifts and sacrifices, and so it was necessary for this one also to have something to offer. If he were on earth, he would not be a priest, for there are already priests who offer the gifts prescribed by the law. They serve at a sanctuary that is a copy and shadow of what is in heaven. And this is why Moses was warned when he was about to build the tabernacle. God says, see to it that you make everything according to the pattern shown you on the mountain. But in fact, the ministry Jesus Christ has received is as superior to theirs as the covenant of which he is mediator and is superior to the old one since the new covenant is established on better promises. For if there had been nothing wrong with that first covenant, no place would have been sought for another. But God found fault with the people and he said, The days are coming, declared the Lord, 
When I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel and with the people of Judah, it will not be like the covenant I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt, because they did not remain faithful to my covenant, and I turned away from them, declares the Lord. This is the covenant I will establish with the people of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. I said, I will put my laws in their minds and write them on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. No longer would they teach their neighbor or say to one another, know the Lord, because they will all know me from the least of them. To the greatest for i will forgive their wickedness and will remember their sins no more verse 13 by calling this covenant new he has made the first one absolute and what is absolute and outdated will soon disappear what is absolute and outdated will soon disappear. It means the old covenant, the, the old covenant will disappear. It will no longer be tenable, no longer be useful. So 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 that <clears throat> you could see where the author is coming from. He said in the previous chapter of our study, which which, which we dealt with in chapter seven, he said the author tried as much as possible by arguing that Jesus Christ is our high priest superior to the high priesthood of Aaron that was still offering sacrifices in the Jerusalem temple at that time. At the time that the author was writing, there was, there, there was the, the temple was still functioning in full. So the high priest was still offering sacrifices as usual according to the law of Moses. Now he turns from the high priesthood to the sanctuary itself and what do we mean by the sanctuary? You see, I am beyond to, to the covenant. Now I'm going to explain everything to you. You see, our high priest is the true heavenly sanctuary. Let us see verses 1 and 2 of that chapter 8. You see, but first, he summarizes what he has established and then transitions to the new topic. He said, the point of what we are saying is this. We do not have, or we do have a high priest who sat at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heaven. We have a high priest who sat at the right hand on the throne of the majesty in heaven and who served in the sanctuary, the true tabernacle set up by the Lord, not by man. The true tabernacle set up by God himself. And Jesus is no more high priest, but one who reigns as king as well. Seated at the right hand of God, now he contrasts the earthly tabernacle with a heavenly one. In other words, he's trying to compare the, the earthly tabernacle and the heavenly one. You see, after Moses led the people out of Egypt to an encampment at the base of Mount Sinai, if you remember, God gave explicit instruction that they were to construct a portable throne room in the desert to serve as the dwelling place of God in their midst. And it was called Tabernacle. So, so for all of us that be hearing Tabernacle, what does it really mean? It means simply a tent. tent. Exodus chapter 25 to 27 explain everything even exodus 35 too hundreds of years later it was superseded by the temple built in jerusalem that is that tent was because if you remember after after david became a king he told nathan the, the prophet that i want to build a den i want to build a temple for god a house for god even though God does not dwell in the house built by a man, but I because I, I want to build a house for God. And if you remember what God said, 
God was very, very happy about that. But he said, you are not going to build the house for me. Why? Because you have too much blood in your hand. But I will let your son build the house for me. If you remember? So, 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 that, so that King David collected all the building materials necessary to build a house for God. Before he died, then he instructed his son, Solomon, that God has appointed you to build a house for me. So that, so that, so that after, so, so what we are now saying was that the first one was built by Solomon in first king that we read in, in, in chapter 5 to 8. Then rebuilt after the exile under Zerubbabel. You see, then it, that which you were also read in extra, uh, extra chapter 3 and 6. And then finally, enlarged by Herod the Great, as we read in John 20, begun in 21 BC, that is after, after the whole temple was destroyed, King Herod became king, and he started building, rebuilding the temple that Solomon built in 21 BC, that is 21 uh, years before the death of Jesus Christ. And you will not believe it, it did not complete it, or the temple was not completed until 64 AD, until 64, after, 64 years after the death of Jesus. Now, our author makes the point that Jesus' service as priest is not in the earthly manner at all. You see, it's not, it's not a, a, a man-made tabernacle but in the original truth that in the original true sanctuary that god himself has set so so in other words the the one that was <clears throat> on the earth was built by moses but the one we are talking about was built by god for for set aside which is a sanctuary up for himself in heaven for the rest of our passages our writer explains the implications of this rather startling assertion now, I want, you to, I want to ask a question now, before we progress. Before Moses, there were sacrifices he made. Where did we first hear about an altar of sacrifice made of for, for God before Moses? Can anybody remember? Where was the first altar set up to make sacrifice for God? Can anybody remember before Moses? I'm not saying after Moses. Before Moses. That is from Adam to Abraham to Isaac. Before, before Joseph now took his uh, brothers to Egypt. So that's before Moses. Where did we ever hear about an altar being built that the sacrifice was going to be made for, to God? Can anybody remember? What did God tell Abraham to do for him, to test his faith? Who can tell me? What did Abraham tell, what did God tell Abraham to do for him, to test if Abraham really has faith in him, whether Abraham is, can be entrusted to be a father of all Some nations? Sacrifice his son. To sacrifice the son. And when you are going to sacrifice, do you sacrifice where? You build what? You build an altar, isn't it? Yeah. You build an altar. So it was on that altar that Abraham placed Isaac. And he was going to dissect him before an angel of the Lord says, Stop. Right? Then after, 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 after Moses, after Moses, then uh, we, we, have, we have so many instances of sacrifices, an altar being built, an altar being built. Can, can, can we just remember quickly because it's not, it's not relevant. I mean, it's relevant to hear, it's a digression, but it's something what we, we, we can just re recap our knowledge about the Bible. Where are uh, altars mentioned, sacrifices or mentioned after Moses? When and Abraham... Uh, after uh, Moses, Moses, after Moses, after Abraham, yeah? After Moses. 
Joshua, Joshua failed to sacrifice after the cross. So, Joshua, um, mm -hmm. yeah. and Joshua, what about Elijah? Yeah, Elijah as well. Elijah, right? Elijah also uh, 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 offered uh, sacrifices. And, and then what happened when when uh, King Saul was uh, going, when King Saul offered sacrifices to God, what happened? Can somebody remember? Can anybody just offer sacrifices to God apart from the priest? No. Why? Why? What was the pronouncement on, on King Saul when he offered sacrifices before the arrival of, of uh, Prophet Samuel? The children of Israel we are faced with a battle with the Philistines. And King Saul now sent for Prophet Samuel to come because they want to make sacrifice to God before they go to the battlefield. But because King Saul delayed in coming and and King and uh, 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 Prophet Samuel delayed in coming, King Saul would not wait. He said, "This man is too late." He started making sacrifices. To God, and when King Saul, I mean, when uh, Prophet Samuel came and saw him making sacrifices to God, what did he say to him? Is it is it in his place to make sacrifices to God? No, no, because that job is specifically reserved for the priest, and it cost King Saul again his own kingdom because when 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 when, when uh, uh, professor Samuel caused him he pulled the, the garment of king Saul, i mean of uh, prophet Samuel, which tore and then god said and prophet Samuel just told him that because you've torn my death that is how god is to, to tear your kingdom from you because you are not supposed to make sacrifices to god so so that's what Batmana was telling us that only the priest can make sacrifices not the king but in this instance now we now have a king making sacrifices which is jesus christ in the order of Melchizedek. so now 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 the true sanctuary progressing on on verses three to five is that every high priest is appointed to offer both gifts every high priest is appointed to offer both gifts and sacrifices and so it was necessary for this one also that is jesus christ to have something to offer if he were on earth if jesus christ was on earth he would not be a priest for there are already men who offer the gifts prescribed by the law and who are these men that is the Levitical order that is the Aaronic priests are already established by the law, so nobody else. So if Jesus Christ were to be permanent on earth, it, it could not, it would not be able, it would not under the law of Moses to make sacrifices. So, so we are not talking about Jesus Christ on earth. So so he's now saying that they serve at a sanctuary. That is the the the, the earthly priest they serve at the sanctuary which is a copy and the shadow of what is in heaven and this is why moses was warned when he was about to build the tabernacle he said god says see to it that you make everything according to the pattern shown you on the mountain see to it the original tabernacle in the wilderness was specified in every particular by God down to the dimension materials to be used and furniture in the courtyard outside and in the tent within our writer underscored this by quoting the Old Testament which said see that you make them according to the pattern shown you on the mountain which we read in Exodus 25 40 now so this suggests that Moses has been shown something like a scale model 
or a blueprint of what it should build. The tabernacle and the temple on earth then are not originals, but copies our writer argue. They serve at a sanctuary that is a copy and shadow of what exists in heaven. That is in verse 5. Now, this may sound a bit like uh, Plato's idealism. We are, uh, what shadow, especially when you are using your, your hand, your finger, to, you know, to make so many images uh, by, by, by reflection through a, a, a high beam, you can make so many images with a shadow. So, so that, that's what he's now saying. But, but clearly, our, our writer's root ideas are based in the Old Testament. He said, if there is a temple, here on earth that is the holy place of Judaism our writer argues it is merely a copy of heavenly sanctuary in the earthly temple still standing when this letter was written well because when when the author was writing this letter the temple was still standing and the functions were still going on so the the ironic priesthood ministers but in the true heavenly sanctuary jesus serves as high priest ministering in a way that no mere human being could now i want to test us again we have been talking about we've been reading about the old testament all of our life what do we really understand by these sacrifices what, what, what kind of sacrifices do the jews do can we remember what kind of what, what, how many sacrifices do they do Because Jesus Christ, when he was born, if you remember, Joseph and Mary, what did they take to the temple, to the high priest? What did they take with them? When they carried baby Jesus with them, what did they take with them? Does anybody remember? Okay. Now, when Jesus went into the temple, to go and clean the temple what were they doing in the temple what did jesus christ scatter in the temple jesus christ said my house shall be called the house of god selling. Hmm? they were selling and gambling in the temple what were they selling cloth shoes gold or what they were selling doves they were selling doves they were selling sheep they were selling and what are they doing with doves and sheep they were used for sacrifice for sacrifice so so contrary to belief the purpose of we, we, the, the, in the jewish uh, uh, language we call it a uh, kobanot all the sacrifices are kobanot you see the purpose of kobanot is not simply to obtain forgiveness from sin because there are so many purposes where they make sacrifices in the Jewish in the Jewish um, um, mosaic law, and those sac sacrifices are called kobanot. They say when the temple stands, every Jew who can is required to come to Jerusalem three times a year for special holiday that require bringing several different types of kobanot, most of which are eaten by the celebrants with their family and friends. Now again most of them are eaten by their families and friends can somebody again tell me who has two wives and went to jerusalem for to, to sacrifice the, the and then after they ate their kubanot the first wife was barren the second wife had three children or children and the husband tried as much as possible to double the, the gifts to the first wife because of her barrenness and she was so unhappy every year they come to Jerusalem she will go home unhappy and this woman believed that one day one day God will hear her prayer who was that woman hmm? Anna. Anna, 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 Anna. thank you so much so the Kubana bring the Jewish people together and build both solidarity between us and our God on the one hand and among us on the other hand. You see, certain Kubanot are brought purely for the purpose of communion with God 
and becoming closer to him. Others are brought for the purpose of expressing thanks, love, or gratitude to God. Others are used to cleanse a person of ritual impurity, which does not necessarily have anything to do with sin. And yet, some kubanot are brought for purpose of atonement. Atonement means cleansing yourself. You see, the atoning aspect of kubanot is carefully circumscribed. You see, for the purpose part, Kobanot only expiate unintentional sin, that is, sins committed because a person forgot that this thing was a sin, but not sin that is purposely committed. You see, no atonement is needed for a violation committed under duress. Under duress means that if you are forced, and for the most part, Kubanot cannot atone for a malicious, deliberate sin. Because if you remember the law of Moses, an eye for an eye. Anyone that kill by the sword will die by the sword. So you cannot kill by the sword and then bring Kubanot you know, to atone for it. No, 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 no. It doesn't work that way. And that was why the, 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 the people, the high priest and everything, they were able to bring that woman, they said, we caught him in adultery. What, what did the law say? The law said she must be stoned to death. Because there was no covenant for them. There was there's nothing she could offer as a sacrifice to atone for that sin. And that is also bringing us gradually to the difference between the Old Testament and the New Testament. Because Jesus Christ said, I did not come to destroy the law, but to fulfill the law. I did not come to fulfill, to, to destroy the law, but to fulfill the law. But here, this instance, believing on, 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 on the assertion that this is the law, so, so, and Jesus Christ is a Jew. So they brought that woman to, to Jesus Christ. We caught her in adultery. And the law says that she must be stoned to get what do you say, Master. But what, what was Jesus Christ's answer? Did he say, go and stone her to death? No. What did he say? So whoever long has sin should be the first to come. Now, did, 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 did Jesus Christ kick against the law? No. No, he didn't kick against the law. Can you please explain to us? Because some people are arguing that he should have, he should have uh, complied with the law of Moses, but he said, no, no, you have, if you have never seen before, they cast a false stone. And then again, they, they told Jesus Christ that, look at your disciples, they were plucking corn on the field on a Sabbath day. Because the law of Moses said that you must work for six days and on the seventh day you must rest. And resting means that you must never touch anything, even a pin. Even though these people are carrying, I mean, taking their goats or their, their asses, their donkey to go and drink water. But they said, no, Jesus Christ, no, you must not heal somebody on the Sabbath day. So, now, is, God, is Jesus Christ kicking against the law of Moses by healing somebody on the Sabbath day? Because the man, the man with the no. withered hand has been crippled for 38 years and has been coming to the temple for 38 years and is a son also of Abraham, enslaved by sin, enslaved, enslaved by Satan. And on the Sabbath day, Jesus Christ wanted to test their faith. He said, stretch off your hand. Is it lawful to do good on the Sabbath day or not? They could not answer it. Did Jesus Christ break the commandment by healing on the Sabbath day? No. No. Why? Are we supposed to do no, good on the Sabbath? Yes, yes, I'm listening. Because he did good on the Sabbath day. Mm -hmm. We must do good on the Sabbath day. Because Jesus Christ said, which of you, when your own donkey enters into a pit or into a well, 
on the Sabbath day will not go back, go down and rescue. Will, will you leave it there inside the well till the following morning? And that consists in walking, isn't it? Yeah. So, 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 which means that the law, the the law of Moses was faulted with so many, so many, so many, so many, so many, so many faults. And that's why Jesus Christ now came not not to destroy that law but to amend it to complement it but not to fulfill it to the last letter but to complement it so so the type of kubanos that we have he said there are many different types of kubanot and the law related to them are detailed and complicated so this section merely introduced some of the major types of kubanot their names and their characters and there are many subtypes there are so many, so many offering, 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 offering. And that is why it was necessary for God to set apart the, the tribes of Levi. So we are not talking about one priest, three priests or anything. We have only one high priest. But we have so more, more than 400 participating, participating uh, 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 junior priests assisting the high priest like all the children of Aaron, all of them. Because the, 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 we, we, we are talking about millions of people bringing goods, does everything, all the traps of Israel, there were 12 of, 12 of them. And all of them, all of them bringing things every three times a year. So, so which means that in one week, they, they will slaughter more than 400 or 4,000 goods. Because if you remember, when Solomon opened that temple, he bought more than 1,000 rams, camels, and all this. So who are going to kill them? So, so you can visualize the, 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 the messy, I, I mean, during, during Ramadan, for some of us that have been used to Islam life, one, during the Ramadan alone, just a family killing one ram, you will see all the mess all over the whole place blood water washing yeah 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 and then the then 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 all, all the, the lungs are all these things and then and then then the smoke of the fire and then how much more when we are not talking about slaughtering more than more than 400 goats uh, uh, different different types of animals so so you can see the smoke you can see everything i, I mean it, it's so messy it's so messy so we have burnt offering which is which in, in, in Hebrew they call Ula. Then we have the peace offering. Then we have, you see, so, so uh, <clears throat> we have so many, so many types of offering. And then we have the sin offering. And then we have the guilt offering. And then we have food and drink offering. A meal offering <clears throat> represents the, the, the devotion of the fruits of man's work. To God because it was not a natural product but something created through man's effort a representative piece of the offering was burnt on the fire of the altar so they will bring the first fruits and then we have para aduma which is the red heifer you see so 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 that, so that then so so we have all this kind of offering that they bring to uh, Jerusalem three times a year to sacrifice to God and, and and then um so so this suggests that moses had been shown something like a scale which we have already said now a superior covenant with better promises that is in verse six a superior covenant with promises now the writer moves from the true temple to the true covenant but the ministry jesus has received is a superior to theirs as the covenant of which he is mediator and is superior to the old one and it is founded on better promises verse 6 our writer introduces two words which we need to understand here covenant and mediator and today in, in, in our loose english we say he left a covenant. He left a covenant. Now, 
um, I, I was going to ask if we understand the definition of covenant, but because of time factor, we have a lot of things to discuss. So I'm just explaining. Now, uh, the, the Greek word for covenant means a uh, last will or testament. The testament means will. That is, my father left a covenant for me. My father left a will for me. That is the interpretation by the Greek. Or a contract. But the reference here is not a Greek word, but an ancient Aramic word that the author is trying to use here for us. <clears throat> it's a Semitic, a, a Semitic concept of covenant in Hebrew, which means it's a, 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 a word used between nations as a treaty, an alliance of friendship between individuals. It is a pledge or an agreement between a monarch and a subject. It's a covenant. It's an agreement. It is a constitution between God and man. A covenant is accompanied by sign, by sacrifices, and a solemn oath that sealed that relationship with promises of blessing for keeping that covenant or causes for breaking it. Now I'm going to ask you a question again. He said, God makes a number of covenants in the Old Testament. God made a host of covenant. Right? He made with Noah. He made with Abraham. He made with Moses. Can anybody remember what kind of covenant God made with any of these three? Noah, Abraham, Moses. Can anybody remember? What covenant did Noah do? Rainbow. Rainbow, beautiful. Thank you, thank you so much. Thank you so much. As we read in Genesis 6, 18, signified by the sign of a rainbow. What does what, what does what, what does the covenant mean? That rainbow. What does what, what did God say about that covenant? About that about that rainbow. He will no longer destroy it. He will no longer destroy the earth with flood. And then what about Abraham? What covenant did God make with with Abraham? After after God brought down Isaac from the altar of sacrifice, then God told him to go and do something that which is going to be a covenant between him and his seed forever, and which the Jews continue to today to observe. What was that covenant? The covenant of circumcision. The covenant of circumcision. And then with Moses and the people of Israel in Exodus 19.24 signified by the blood of the covenant sprinkle on the people. Exodus 24.8 The words of the covenant, the Ten Commandments is another covenant contained in the Ark of the Covenant which symbolizes the throne of God who dwell in the armies. Now, the establishment of a covenant was a solemn thing. Several covenants we find in the Bible have similarities with an ancient kingdoms, treaties they found in the ancient world. And in that ancient world, more powerful king will make various promises of protection to help the smaller nations, the less powerful king. And in return, that king will expect complete and utter fidelity, loyalty. So that you know, king, if you rebel against the king, it will tantamount to treason. And he will break that covenant and will cause the army of that greater king to invade the, the territory of that smaller king and punish them with severity. Now, do you still remember one instance? that uh, that kind of a covenant was broken when the children of israel including somewhere i mean including uh joseph and all of them were carried into captivity what covenant was broken then what led what what was the problem that that uh, jeremiah had which during which king was Jeremiah existing? Now, 
If you remember, Ezekiah was the king of Judah. When uh, Nebuchadnezzar came and um, made a covenant with them that he would protect them. Then um, the captains of Hezekiah told him that don't pay any tribute to Nebuchadnezzar because we will solicit the assistance of the king of Egypt to come and help us. So he stopped paying tithes. I mean, sorry, he stopped paying uh, tribute and all these things. And then Nebuchadnezzar came. And what did he do? He plucked out his eyes, he killed all his children, he took away uh, Hezekiah in chain, he took away all the the the, the 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 royal sons and all this, he carried everything into captivity. So that's an example of a covenant being broken. So the covenant we are sealed with terrible oaths sometimes, and that is what we see in God's covenant with Abraham. So the Lord said to him, the Lord said to him, Bring me a heifer, a goat and a ram, each three year old, along with a dove and a young pigeon. Can you believe it? A heifer, a goat, a ram, a dove and a young pigeon. And Abraham brought all this to him. He cut them into two and arranged the halves opposite each other. The birds, however, he did not cut in half. Then birds of prey came down on the carcasses, but Abraham drove them away, as we read in Genesis 15, 9 to 11. But when the sun had set and darkness had fallen, a smoking fire poured with a blazing torch appeared and passed between the pieces. On that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abraham. Can somebody read for me? That Genesis 15, 17 to 18, so that we can understand it. You can mark it in your Bible. Genesis 15, verses 17 to 18. Genesis 15, Genesis 15, 17 to 18b. It reads, it said, um, when, this, when the sun had set and darkness has fallen, a smoking fire pot with a blazing torch appeared and passed between the pieces. On that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abraham, with Abram, and said to your descendants, I give this land from the wadi of Egypt to the great river, the Euphrates, the land of the Canaanites, Canaanites, Kadimunites, Etites, Perizzites, Amorites, Canaanites, Kizba, and Jebusites. So, in other words, this is the first. This is the first covenant that God made with Abraham before he became Abraham. God made a covenant with him before he left the land of Oz. So, 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 so that for most of us that don't know the history, I'm, I'm also reading it, I'm also gaining from it now. So this suggests that Moses had been shown something that, that, um, resem that resembles what Jesus Christ had come to do. So it was called cutting the covenant. You see, there's a widespread evidence that in the biblical world, animals were slaughtered in treaty contract, uh, uh, contraction ceremonies. When the parties to the treaty walk between the rows of flesh, freshly killed animals, flesh, they place a cause upon them. So in other words, what they are saying is that in those days, before Jesus Christ came, when, 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 when blood covenants are made, they kill so many animals, they, 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 they uh, cut the, the disembowel the, the, uh, and, and then they, they spread them and then they ask the, the parties the covenant to walk through them to walk through them and then then so so that what they are now saying is that may they too be caught so that if you break that covenant 
You see, when the parties to the treaty walk between the rows of fleshy kill animals' flesh, they place a curse upon themselves. May they too be caught limp from limp if they violate the treaty or covenant as in Jeremiah 34, 18 to 20. Now, somebody was telling me that the reason why politicians and all these people break covenant is because by, by swearing with the Quran or by swearing with the Bible, they didn't take it serious at all. But if but in those days, in those days of our fathers, they hardly break covenant. They are afraid to break covenant. So why do you think why do you think today people swear by the Bible? But the moment they put the Bible down, they just forget about it. Is it because they feel God cannot punish them? Or, what, what, I mean, because it, it, it baffles me really because when you are swearing in President of the United States of America, you swear by the Bible. And say, God help me, uh, uh, I mean, uh, so help me God. But sooner they put the Bible down, after about a few, few months uh, uh, in, in, white, in, in White Office, uh, in White House, they, they forget. Do you think it is necessary to be swearing at all with the Bible? Because you, you swear by the Bible to speak the truth and nothing but the truth in the court. But the moment you open your mouth is lie, 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 lie. The policeman lie, 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 lie. So, so gentlemen or, or, or saints of Mount Zion, do we still need to be swearing by the Bible in court or swearing in kings, president, uh, politicians with the Bible? Or the Quran? Or why do you think they, 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 it has become a ceremony and not, not, not taken seriously? Let us discuss it. What's your reaction to it? Or let me ask you if you, are, if you swear by the Bible, will you keep it? Will you keep that covenant? We are supposed to keep it. I'm talking about you. If you swear by the Bible, will you, if you if you are made to swear by the Bible, will you keep the covenant? Yes. As a Christian. And but for the mere fact that I have sworn to the Bible, that would be a reminder. That would be a fear in me that I have sworn to the Bible to to speak the truth or to live by my my promises or my words. Now, do you think it is still relevant today to use, I mean, to use the Bible or the Quran or whatever to swear politicians or president, or it's not necessary again? I think it's necessary. Yeah, Pastor Paul. Yeah, yeah. Uh, maybe just uh, come in. That's that's a very relevant point, Pastor Lambo. But uh, you know, our God. That's why. That's why. We're talking about the law and we're talking about Christ being the perfect sacrifice. Mm -hmm. You see, our Lord is slow to anger. Mm -hmm. So if you go and swear by the Bible mm -hmm. and you do the wrong thing, I believe in my spirit. Mm -hmm that at that point you may not experience the the the, the consequences the result that's right but there is a time coming that you will give an account mm -hmm. okay there is a time that is coming okay it's, and that is for all of us and one of the things i see is that they very politicians that so but some of them don't even know who Christ is. That's right. So for some of them it's just a ceremonial thing. But make no mistake. That's right. It's just as you were saying, it's a covenant. It is covenant, that's just that is true. So you break in your side of the covenant, but there is a time coming that you give an account. And even for us the Christian today. That's right. apply to us. We read the scripture. That's right. God 
there are things that we're not supposed to do, but we continue to do them. But we don't see the, we don't see something happening to us. Those days, the priest, even the priest himself, when he enters the holy of holy, mm -hmm. 